What's up, everybody? This is the Poker Coaching Study Session. And today we have a special guest. Michael Acevedo is here with us. So, yep. Michael, we have a few questions for you. Uh, let's look at the first one. So, all right. When you're looking at database analysis, what's the just, most important stats you're looking at? Uh, just give me a second to uh, take um, hey. a video for this and then I'll, I'll upload it to Instagram later. So just very quickly sure. here. Sure, sure, sure. Let's see, I like how Louis put on his radio voice the second I awesome <laughs> Hey, uh, Louis, <laughs> do you want to give uh, Michael a chance to uh, introduce himself for maybe the viewers who aren't familiar? Oh, yeah, sure, 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 for sure. Yeah, all right. Um, well, my name is Michael Acevedo. I am the author of Modern Poker Theory, uh, which is by many regarded as um, probably the, the top um, book for learning GTO um, right now. And well, yeah, I've been a, a professional poker player for the last 10 years. I've been a professional poker coach for the last, I don't know, maybe seven years. And um, yeah, uh, I'm also a physicist. So um I have a background in math, which helped me uh, a lot in, in regard to understanding, you know, the concepts and everything. And yeah, so that's pretty much who I am. And well, I'm glad to be here and hopefully we can learn some, you know, some things together. So let's see what uh, questions you guys have for me and, and go from there. All right. So our first question is regarding uh, database analysis. So uh, what's the most important stats you're looking at when you're doing a database analysis? Uh, like besides like the positional win rates, because mm -hmm. uh, from your book, there's a great, great portion that I refer very often. Uh, it's the win rates by position based on like the big winners, the small winners. And so that's one of my favorite parts. Uh, but besides that, uh, what do you look at when you do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a very uh, large uh, Poker Tracker 4 report uh, with some custom stats that I built myself. I uh, typically, um, when I have a one on one coaching session with my students, I will be uh, just, you know, uh, getting them to send me the database and I will just run the report on that. So I have a bunch of stats and uh, I like to see the whole picture because sometimes you see uh, something pop up when you connect a few stats, you know, some uh, with another one and then you see something, you know, it's just see a trend on, you know, what's probably the leak in general um, yeah, for, for the student. Um, the most important stats that I always look at and I, I think are absolutely care, for example, race first in by position, that's probably, you know, the most one of, if not the most important one right because you want to see exactly you know how many hands is each player racing by position um i like to break it down now i have a bunch of pop-ups however also a very complex hub that i created many years ago maybe in 2015 for um pokerhots.com and uh this one is for poker tracker i also made one for holding manager for them actually well i made it for myself but then i sold it to them <laughs> Uh, that was uh, you know many years ago. So I have a bunch of very nice pop-ups that you know show me more uh, in detail the stats. Once you have a very big sample, your opponents those are very useful. And then I like to see <clears throat> the race first thing breaking down not only by position but also uh, by stack size. So you can see, for example, if somebody has like uh, I don't know ten to fifteen big blinds. How how often are they open showing from the position in contrast to open mean racing and stuff like that? So racing first thing is absolutely key in my opinion, uh, because from race first thing you can infer what's happening, right? Let's say you see somebody's racing first thing from the bottom, uh, let's say uh, sixty five or seventy percent over a decent sample, then you know for sure there's no way he's gonna have uh, he he can defend that range against three bets. Right. So you don't even need to know what's his fault to tribut frequency just by knowing that he's opening too many hands way more than what he can defend. Right. You can just attack him relentlessly because, you know, that, you know, uh, there's, it's impossible for him to defend that range. Right. So does, does that kind of things are really important for me uh, to pay attention to race first in. Uh, next one could be probably fall to tribut. Uh, that's also a very good one. Right. Of course, if you look, um, uh, if you see some some guys are just folding, you know, like, um, uh, you know, seven out of eight times or whatever. So just just always fold to three So just yeah, yeah, they're easy targets. You can just attack them relentlessly. Um, what else is really important in, in tournaments? Probably check race. Flop check race is one of the 
the most important ones and aggression factor. I like to look at the aggression factor, not, not so too much the aggression frequency. Those stats are a bit different. Um, the aggression factor is a ratio of how many times uh, the player took an aggressive action like betting or racing divided by the number of times he took a passive action uh, like calling, I guess, or uh, I'm, yeah, checking is not included, I don't think. But uh, just this ratio is really important because uh, you just you can see, you know, if somebody has an aggression factor of, let's say, three, you know, he's three more times more likely to put in a race or, um, or, or a bet than a call on any given street. So that's very important. Um, also, uh, the aggression factor is a stat that it should be... Um, it should go in a trend that it's lower for each street. So it should be, let's say your aggression factor on the flop is three. Then in, in the trunk should be like 2.5 or 2.2 .2 or something like that. And then on the, on the river should be like 1.5, right? So, but many players have it in bears. And when you see them having it in bears it's because they are definitely um, slow playing too many hands on the flop in turn, not being aggressive enough. And then they suddenly, uh, you know, try to get value in the river. So, or uh, also they're just not, uh, racing enough as a bluff either way so they're just super passive on flops and turns and they just you know show up a bunch of aggression on the river and uh, this type of trends are the stuff that i'm looking for when i do some database review uh fall to continuation bet is also really really important uh at least on the flop right um it's very difficult for tournaments to have a sample in which you can really <laughs> evaluate you know turn and river fall to continuation bet and, and these stats this, these are kind of more important when you're playing cash games because you're going to be facing the same opponents the same regulars over and over and over again so you're looking for um when you look for a database in depth for you know cash games, you're looking for different things because you're trying to understand each one of your opponents and how to exploit each one of them, especially the regulars, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, exploiting the weaker players is, is kind of easy, right? Like most of them are fall, you know, gonna fall within the same sort of um uh patterns right so it's you know it's kind of easy like okay this guy is way too sticky calls too much you just you know just uh take him to value town this guy over falls just you know bet small every time stuff like that it's very easy to attack the weaker players once you identify who they are um but the regulars uh, if you're playing cash games or even in tournaments right if you want to start you know doing better against the better players especially if you when you move up in the stakes you need to know how each one of them play and you know, the best player at each stake level is always going to be the guy who can adjust the best against each one of the other players because most of the regulars will be extracting sort of the same amount of money from the weaker players, right? Um, so the difference in, in the bottom line between one regular and another regular could be how much money are you losing or winning against the other regulars in your uh in your stakes so that's that's really relevant when you are playing especially higher stakes when the pools are, are shallower smaller the small pools and you face the regulars more more frequently <clears throat> but for tournaments you know mtt's you know normal stakes uh fields are so big that the most important thing is to uh, pay attention to population tendencies and kind of have an idea of you know how population tend to um play in on certain situations. So for example, even the regulars, you know, you can put them in some category, like, you know, this is a very tight regular, this is a very loose and aggressive regular or stuff like that. So you don't have to be, you know, making, adjusting your play so much exactly to the specific player, but kind of at least to the category in which ah. you put that player, right? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, and okay, what, what other stats I look for? So continuation bet, uh, flop check race is really important. Uh, uh, turn check racing, I also like to look at, and, and turn dunk bet. Turn dunk bet is really important um, because, uh, well, flop dunk bet is not so, um, what's the word? So uh, it's something that you, you just, so flop dunk bets, it's not something that happens all that often, right? And so when somebody dunk bets on you, uh, it's, if he's a regular, it probably is just a very good flop for dunk betting. Let's say something like six, five, four, you know, uh, uh, two tone, whatever. It's a very good flop for you, for uh, the people to dunk bet in, through, uh, in position, right? Uh, but if you see somebody dunk betting into you in something like king, five, three, 
where it's that so 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 normal to happen and you see some recreational player he just probably has it or you know you can just, then you can just figure out just try to figure out what's he doing like um if the if the players don't get you on the flop is a recreational player they it's normally one of two things right they either have the king at least or you know good hand they just try to bet into you because that's how they play or they have a very you know like uh kind of weakish hand and are trying to get to you know the next street by cheap or whatever so once you figure out you know what's the reason why they're done betting you can adjust so easily if you know that this guy always don't bet when he has to pair you just always fall whatever you have and if he's always on betting we you know medium strength hands whatever just always raise him and then just you know bump the turn and just smash the rivet and see what happens right just put him to the test so um things like this right um so turn down bet uh uh Flop check raise, uh, flop fault continuation bet, flop continuation betting is important. Also, like you know, sometimes you'll see a guy, uh, flop continuation bet is something like 56 percent, 60 percent. You're like, what? Like, uh, flop continuation bet should be really, really high, like 80 percent, even 90 percent in, in MTTs. Uh, so when you see somebody is simulating only like you know, very uh, low frequency in the flop, um. Is also is also something that you can really attack very well once you know what you know what kind of range either checking back and, and things like this and so when they bet you can you have a very easy fall when you have a hand that is probably you know a threshold hand that you're okay this is a hand that could probably you know do whatever call you may even raise sometimes or fall you just always fall right and, and fold everything that is marginal against these guys on the flop stuff like that um yeah, so aggression factor, I mentioned that. What other stats are really important that I look on the database? Um, okay, river um, uh, call efficiency. This is a, a really good one. Um, What's like, a good target for river call efficiency? Uh, between, I'll say 1.8 and 2, Okay. right? Yeah, 1.8 like two and 2. Okay. Because this is basically, basically a ratio of uh how many chips are you making back on your river calls for every chip you invest right yeah. so ideally you should be making at least 1.8 or two times uh you know then the number of chips you're investing on river calls if you are if your river call efficiency is higher than two you're probably uh over folding too much you only call when you're sure that you have it and if it's lower than let's say 1.5 1.8 1.5 or lower you're um you're calling way too much. You're here calling way too much on the rear. Yes. So yes, that's a good ratio. That's not a very good stat to, uh, to look into. Uh, mm -hmm. I have one on my hut uh, that I like to look at. Uh, that is um, a number of times that a player bet the river and got called and how many of those times he had it. So that's a very good stat to have uh, in your hut as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. All What's right, a so good I think target for a check raising per frequency on the flop. Uh 16 to 20%, I'll okay. say. Okay. Yeah. So so Michael, when you're trying to determine these baselines, what kind of process do you go through to do some of that? For instance, like it's pretty obvious, like with the RFI frequencies, you can just check some GTO uh, charts and try to match those frequencies. But for some of these more complex uh stats, where how do you determine those baselines? Yeah, well, uh, I've been coaching for like seven years and, and most of my students are professional poker players. So I've, I've seen and studied hundreds of databases of professional poker players. Uh, and so uh, my my numbers or, you know, the, the general idea that I have for these stats are based on, uh, you know, uh, population and stuff that I've seen, you know, what is typically good for, you know, winning players. Yeah. Okay. All right, question number two. Uh, if you think a person is missing bluffs uh, in his line or in his range, uh, how much can you overfold versus like a GTO solution? Like for example, pre-flop uh, against three bed because most players don't find enough three bed bluffs uh, on the river against like river beds uh, versus like triple barrels. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the river is the easiest one to play because it's just a matter of, you know, um, if they are under bluffing the river you just fold everything every single thing except um hands that beat some portion of their value range right so let's say if um the bottom of their value range is two pair you just call any two pair right or um 
yeah, stuff like that. Like let's say the bottom of the value range is bottom two pair that you call, uh, you know, uh, middle, whatever, you know. So it's just something that you know that a bit, uh, at least some portion of the value range, you can call everything that is like that and better. It's so easy, right? Because there, there's no betting involved. Now for uh, other streets, when there's future betting involved, um, you know, it's a bit more complex, but uh, same thing. Like if you look at um, the EV, this is something that is very useful when you look at the EV of the, of calling, you know, what, how many chips are you actually making with calling some bottom hands from your range, some threshold hands, right? So if you're making like 0 0.01 big blind, so close to zero uh, against a GTO range, and somebody's in you pre-flop with, you know, a tighter range than usual, then all of the hands that are very close to zero EV are going to be losing immediately. So you just fold those, right? And just make sure that you call hands that, you know, uh, have a decent um, EV or hands at least that if you... Um, this is something you can do by hand very easily if you have a, an equity calculator. Just input the range um, <clears throat> that you think you're being triggered by uh, into, let's say, Power Equilab, something like that, right? And then you input, um, let's say, the threshold hand, something like, I don't know, King Jack suited or some, um, I don't know, um, uh eight seven suited, whatever hand it is right so just put those hands in the in in the range in power equilab and you can apply something that is called um an equity realization factor right and you can kind of estimate and i actually included the equity realization factor uh charts in my book so you can take those equity realization factors apply them to the power equilab thing and see like okay so i'm really going to be probably under you know realizing my equity against this range so just put it and see if even including the you know the equity realization factors what type of hands tend to do well against this, you know, tighter range. And you can always, you know, just, uh, it's, a, always, it's always kind of the same hands, like, you know, like pocket pairs tend to do very well because once you hit, you just, you know, doesn't matter what they have, you just always, you know, um, uh, get stacks of sobriety to play. So um, once you do this sort of work, you start to develop the intuition, like, okay, yeah, yeah this type of hands I can call, this type of hands I can't call is, but sometimes you have to put in the work, right? Once you do it yourself and you see like, okay, these hands definitely not not make it. These hands tend to make it in this situation, or I need to be way deeper for make this this type of hand to work. Or you know, uh, for example, uh, calling something like a king jack um, is gonna be way better when you're shallow because if you make a pair, then you're just getting stacks in. And calling something like a six five suited would be way better when you are deeper because now you can make a really hitting a strong hand against you know pocket aces and and get stacks for a hundred big blinds, two hundred big blinds spots or. You know, it's what you're looking for. And once you put in this type of work, you start to develop the intuition yourself as a player. And it's something that you have to do. You just, uh, you just can't skip by it and, you know, uh, get some sort of tables that you can memorize what you can do, what you can. You have to put in the work. And once you do that, you develop the, the intuition as a player. And then you can, uh, of course, you just become a stronger player. All right. Very nice. <clears throat> uh, now, uh... What are, what are the top three exploits do you think people are missing in their game nowadays? Top three exploits that people are yeah. missing? Yeah. Uh, okay, let me see. Um, top of my head, easily. Uh, I, I know you just actually showed me the, the, the questions, but I, I, I didn't. Um, uh, I don't like doing uh, the, the work for oh, the way. I like, I like, yeah, I like to do it on, on, on the spot. So um, top of my head, I think that Maybe not check racing um, against guys who just fire any flop, you know, uh, like betting a small uh, on most flops is, is okay. But if you really look as you have, as I know you have, if you really look into the, the simulations, right? Some flops are way better suited for bigger bet size and splitting your range into a betting range and checking range. And when you see somebody just betting a small in those situations, you can just check racing with any two cards pretty much because they probably have nothing most of the time. So check racing very aggressively against a small bet size, especially in boards where you know the villain should be using a larger bet size. It's a very nice exploit that people are missing a lot. Um, For example, board with like two broadways. 
No, I'm talking more about um, boards that hit your range. Like let's say uh, a an eight five two board, you know, uh, whatever, and your opponent bets like one third, where they should be like over betting, especially. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What they say, yeah, they don't. nine pocket ten stuff like that. Right? Yeah, exactly. You just check raise them, and they just you know uh, check raise them, and then just you know fight again on the turn because if you check race flow yeah they float with a bunch of like uh two over cars and backdoor flush shows whatever and then uh on the turn if the turn is a low card you bet again they just have so much air that you just, just can't continue right so that's a very good exploit um to be taking against against these people um this is probably not, not an exploit but a, actually it's actually a gto play that people don't don't take enough and this one is when you trivet of the blinds from let's say, I don't know, 40 big blind stacks, 50, 40, 30 big blind stacks, even and even lower stacks, right? There are so many boards that are super connected, like you know, straight boards like um um 10, 10.98 or 10.97, whatever, you know, uh, two tone boards that even if you have like three X pot, whatever, you know, four X pot, you can just shove up and shove uh, uh on the flop, so many hands. Um like ace king, ace queen, stuff like that. There's so many hands, yeah, that you can just open shove uh, and and just um, uh, when once you treat it, you treat it from the blinds, right? You get called by bottom card or whatever, and you just you know the board is something like uh, you know ten nine seven. There's so many hands that you get to open shove for like three exports, for export doesn't matter, uh, because you just put so much pressure on your opponent, they just are forced to fold so much equity, and there are so many hands that are supposed to call that you just won't be calling. That is just so 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 profitable. So I'll suggest you, you know, take a look at these type of boards, you know, straightly connected boards and see the type of hands that you get to shove. This is very good because no one, no one is doing it. And I, I suspect that people will start doing it more and more because it's something that shows up very, very consistently in all of GTO simulations. So that's another one. Um, another exploit um, that people uh, are probably missing a lot. Let me see. Uh, could be using a small bet sizes in ICM situations. Like uh, you don't you don't really have to um, to use very large bet sizes to put in a lot of pressure into your opponents when you know you're playing final two tables and final tables and and yeah, there's it's not really so necessary. You can um, shrink your bet sizes by a lot, and it's something that actually I, I'm I'm probably guilty myself of missing out because I I you know I, I tend to a bit too static with my bet sizes but once you're in this situation you can lower them up because people are not supposed to call trivet so much now if you're playing against somebody who you know is sticky and is still going to call you then just of course you just uh, keep your standard bet size or you can even go bigger but against most people who kind of know what's going on with icm you can just you know lower your bet sizes by a lot and that's something that's going to be very profitable for you yeah okay very nice um with the mass availability of like tools like GTO Wizard uh, that are kind of defining like the current poker, poker meta, uh, what are the most common costly mistakes when you use these tools? And what are some ways that we can use like these tools more efficiently? Well, probably one is that um, a lot of these tools tend to split the ranges into way too many bet sizes, which is absurd and uh useless in my opinion like normally all, all you need to know is if you want to bet small medium or large for the most part right so um yeah all these tools just have too many bet sizes split the ranges in too many pieces and it gets so confusing to follow through once you're getting to driver stuff like that it gets kind of useless when you have flop 10 bet sizes and then turn 10 bet size you get to the range like the ranges make no sense are, are just so weird ranges so many times so um don't take everything you know uh out from them like you know for granted like if you know it's um the gospel or anything like that because um a lot of time these ranges are also not gonna have anything to do with actual ranges and don't try to memorize outputs at all just try to understand why the server is doing something with some type of hands right so there's some hands that is always like okay you want to always bet these type of hands for value yeah easy right but then you get to the threshold hands those are the hands that you should be paying attention to uh you know what hands are like you know um 
the sword really you know just, it, it is splitting into one action and another one and you know this kind this kind of things it, the trends is what you should be looking for so what i like to do when i use solvers or this type of tools is i look for the trend so what's the general trend and then look for the outliers right if you understand the trend say so okay uh this is a, a board where um most of my range was to go a small bet size high frequency continuation bet but maybe 15 percent 20 percent of my hands want to over bet right why so you look look at those that are off the trend so that and, and and that's how you understand poker right so first understand okay this is the board where typically my range wants to do this and that and this makes sense why why does it make sense for all of these hands to want to follow this trend? And once you understand that, okay, look for the outliers. Why are these hands uh, being played so differently from the rest? And once you, you know, pick on this, these few things, you start to develop a deeper understanding of the game. And that's this is what, I, what I recommend for, for people to you to work with solvers and these type of tools. Okay. Very so nice. pair, pairing on with that question, um, Timothy in the chat asked, uh, would you recommend studying the simple solutions with uh, free, size, free sizings? Yes. What is he? Okay. Yes, much better. And if you if you have um, a solver of your, of your own, right? And you can, let's say, um, even if you find out that, you know, in one board, the most used bet size is just one, whatever, just if you can rerun the same Fewer. with just one bet sizes, yeah, that's gonna be much better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, another important, important thing is to look for, um, and this is something that nobody's doing, and it is um, aggregate reports data. And mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I developed a, a very unique tool uh, that I've been using for studying, you know, aggregate reports. Um, Back in, I don't know, maybe 2016, I've been having this for years now. I, I, a lot of the charts in my book from come from that tool, you know, when I can see continuation betting or uh, response to continuation betting by stack size in, across all boards or flops by texture, you know, as um, a structure of those things. So you can see, you know, the bigger picture and the patterns and sometimes many things pop up that you wouldn't see otherwise. It's, it's like when you look at one scene, it's like looking at one tree from the forest. But when you look at the aggregate report, you're looking at the whole pictures, the whole forest, and then you can see so many patterns and things pop up that you wouldn't find otherwise. So um, trying to spend some time at least uh, paying attention to this. And a lot of this is going to show up in my next book as well. So uh, something that I'm, I'm very uh, interested in and I think is going to be the future because, uh, again, when you are studying unique flops, there are 22,100 unique flops, right? And so the most important thing is to see how you can, you know, organize them in groups, families, in all of those things, so that you can, uh, uh, when you're studying one spot, you know how to apply it, you know, to a wider variety of situations instead of just the unique situation that you're looking into right now. Because many times you could be like, okay, so this board should be played this way. And you look to another board that um, feels like it's similar, but at the end it's not. And once you... Um, uh, you and I see many players make these mistakes where they think one board is very similar to another one, but in reality it's not, and the output is completely different. So they messed up a lot in in that regard. Uh, Michael, are you talking about uh, Power BI? Yep. Yeah. Well, okay, I tried to figure Michael. out. I tried to figure that out. I saw you. Uh, I saw that in one of your webinars, and I could not figure out how to use it. But man, it looks fantastic. All right. Yeah. Uh, I was I was wondering uh, for groupings when it comes to uh, aggregated reports uh, we we have a lot of our own reports I don't know if you can see the screen uh, this is yep. a little bit of what we do so like uh, this is a 40 big blind under the gun versus big blind with like five 450 flops uh, we like to break it down based on the i cards we also like to break it down by, based on pair boards straight boards. Uh, I was I was wondering what kind of grouping would you suggest? Yeah, because it's um, all about grouping, right? To find strategies, if you find good good groupings, it's kind of easy to find the, the patterns, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the thing is, the way I did it in in Power BI is pretty cool because um, 
I I create a database in a way where, which I can drill down within the level. Like I can choose, for example, something like, uh, you know, ace high boards and then drill down within the category and and I can see all of, all of the ace high boards breaking down by, you know, the texture, like, okay, monotone, two-tone, rainbow, or I can do the way around. I can get into rainbow boards and then see all of the ace high boards or compare them, you know, ace high, king high, or the rainbow board. So there are so many ways in which I can reorganize and restructure, categorize it with this tool that is, is insane. And yeah, I've had this for like, so many years like I, I think i created this in like back in like 2016 2017 i don't know and no one's ever had you know created anything similar and so the the, the, the main categories in my opinion are the ones that i um uh, explain on, on more poker theory uh, i would say like you know by texture you know so um monotone two-tone rainbow um and pair boards of course trips and then high card of course you know ace high king high all, all those are probably the the, uh, the most important ones. Yeah. And then, um, how many possible slope straights are there? Because okay. that's a huge difference when you see a board where you know the big blind can flop three different possible straights, or a board where the big blind can flop zero possible straights. It's a huge difference. All right. So I guess we're on the. We pretty much have all of these already. Like <clears throat> Uh, these are like, for example, straight boards based on high cards. So I guess we're in a good way with that. Nice. Yeah. Um, now the, the, the tough question. Uh, do you trust the machine or the player? Uh, when a big name in poker uh, gives a bad GTO advice, where do you stand? Do you go, do you trust the machine? Do you trust the player? What do you think about that? Can you give me an example? <laughs> An example, well, there's a lot. Uh, say, for example, a big name that has won a lot of money. Uh, for example, Faraz Jaka uh, gives a, a, an advice on a spot. And you look at the sim and it makes no sense at all. Uh, what, what do you usually go by? Do you kind of rely on the sim? Or do you rely on like more of like... Uh, the, uh, a successful player kind of well this is where um you know poker is not solved right so um a gto solution is just as good as the input that you put on it right so if your ranges um don't really match uh the population or the billion tendencies at all right then um the output could be completely different against you know population of a particular set of players. So if you know very well who you're playing against, you can deviate so well. But uh, the the thing about this is that to be able to deviate, you need to know what the equilibrium looks like, right? Um, the the easiest example that I like to put uh, is, for example, on a pair board, right? Let's say a board is like Jack Jack Six, and um, if you put that in a GTO solver, it will just set mimbit every time, right? You can mimbit range. It, let's say when you open from early position, middle position, four B blanks, B blank calls, uh, you can mimbit 100% of your range, right? So, um, but if you know that the B blank is uh, a very sticky player, it just doesn't like folding anything at all. And um, so, you could exploit him so easily by you know betting bigger like let's say you could want to put a two-third spot bet size but you know when you have a set you know trips or better and just you know take him to value town like you just bet three-quarter spot on the flop and then you pot turn and just shove the river you know whatever and um this is a very um ev evident exploit <clears throat> right but when you're doing it against somebody who is unaware completely unaware that your standard bet size here is going to be mean bet range <laughs> you know you can just attack them like that so this is an example where if you look at the gt simulation you will like what the fuck is this guy doing he's supposed to mean bet the flop he just knows nothing about you know poker you could be you could be super confused right but um in this car in this case because i know who i'm playing against and i know that you know i can just extract so much value when i have a, a real hand against this guy i can completely throw off you know uh the gto simulation the solution and go for 
you know, a Emax exploit style here. Now, um, yeah, so this is something that uh, you have to be very, uh, very experienced to be able to do this. So, uh, and the best way to do it, in my opinion, is when you know the equilibrium, because you also know what risks are you taking and how far can you actually deviate and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, if you see somebody who you don't really trust, this is the thing. If you see somebody like you're saying something, okay, I'm doing this because you know X, Y, Z, whatever, uh, and it completely is the opposite from the solver, and you're like, well, I'm not sure if I really trust this guy. Then just don't trust him, right? Uh, I will only listen to people who I really, really trust, who I admire, or whatever you know that I know. Okay, this guy is putting the work, and definitely if he's doing this, and these are the reasons why he's doing it okay, it makes sense. Then I can trust him. If not, uh, I'll just probably uh, ignore him and, and lean more towards the output from the machine. Okay, very nice. Um, now regarding uh, your book, More Than Poker Theory, uh, is there any part you would want to add or do differently? <clears throat> okay. Um, when, when I first wrote the book, um, the original contract said that I, I was supposed to deliver something like 260 pages. I ended up sending almost 500 pages. So I was like double of, you know, everything. At the end, uh, with edition and everything, uh, they edited and ended up being like 480 pages. Um, so I definitely over-delivered. Uh, it was almost impossible for me to reduce um, the all the concepts and the ideas, everything, all the material, I kind of, you know, reduce it to the bare minimum that I could put together and and, and not leave like anything that was really important, um, you know, out. But I could have, um, I, I wish I, I, you know, if I had like infinite number of pages, of course, like if I could have written a 1000 pages book, but, you know, <laughs> it would have been crazy. And the thing with poker is that it's pretty much infinite. Um, so you have to be very careful also not to overdo it. And, you know, and something, but but definitely I wish I had um, uh, more, maybe more, yeah, space. I don't know what what to say how to say this in english but you know maybe more pages or you know stuff to do to include more uh detail in in tour and river strategy because those kind of fell short um to what i wanted to do and uh yeah there was so much more to be said about turn and river and and i just probably you know touched the tip of the iceberg in in those topics but again you know if if i go as deep as i did with the flop and the pre-flop stuff in turn and river it would have easily been a you know 1000 plus pages book actually <laughs> i could yeah i could even write like a, a single book on turn play and a single book in river play and not cover everything that is be, to be said about those those things right so uh there's always more that i wish i could be you know i could add uh about changing the book uh not really i actually i'm i'm, I'm very proud of it i think um it, it came out just you know almost you know perfectly it took a lot of planning though uh, for me to organize all the concepts and, you know, make it um, in such a way that most people could actually understand what, you know, what I was talking about. Because uh, originally when um, when I was offered the contract to write the book, uh, I was um, sharing some articles with a study group that I used to have. I used to be a part of a study group with uh, Abe Sals, Jim and Fleet, uh, Stephen, Ch Stephen Chidwick, Ilio Fox, Martin Kozlov. Uh, Danny DeVos was there. Uh, Dylan Linde was there uh, at the end. So some of the greatest poker minds, and, and we would just like weekly, you know, get together and share articles that we, you know, we will get into a spot and just, you know, study very in depth and then share it with the group. So I have a lot of articles written by myself and, you know, everything that we share with the group. And all of those articles were very advanced and complex. So <clears throat> you don't have to uh, 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 start by defining what equity is and what EV is, and you know so many things that you know we just understand. So when you're talking poker with somebody who's an expert as well, uh, the lingo and everything else is so different than when you're talking poker to somebody who's starting or who knows nothing. So the most complex complex task of the book probably was to. Uh, make it in such a way that, you know, anybody picking up the book who at least knew the, the rules of the game 
could understand everything from you know the the most basic stuff all the way to the most advanced stuff and building in, building up everything and then what topics to include because there's so many things like you know okay icn uh risk premium do you really want to talk about these things cash games ranges there's so so many things so choosing what to talk about uh uh up to what depth talk each one of the topics and in which order all those things are really, really important it was probably one of the most difficult parts of the book because the theory itself i had been you know building for years and i pretty much had everything i have way so much more like in you know my documents excel spreadsheets and and documents and articles so many things that you know to, to pick from so the most the most difficult thing was probably to organize everything oh, very interesting Okay, next question. Uh, with 50 players left in a PKO tournament, uh, how do you adjust your range for uh, <coughs> bounty power scenarios? Uh, basically, what, do you have an easy trick to, uh, to go from an ICM range to uh, going a little bit wider for PKO, but then like you're deep in a tournament, this, there's that gray zone that is kind of not well-defined right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... For the most part, to be honest with you, um, I try to avoid PKO tournaments unless I know there's like, um, they're really like really, really good. Like for example, a America's card has some like really, really great uh, PKO tournaments. The fields are incredibly soft. Uh, I'm not by any means a PKO expert. So I know the most, you know, um, okay. uh, basic okay. stuff, like, you know, the bounty power, stuff like that. I understand that. I, I um I study the concepts, but for the most part, to be honest with you, what I do is try to avoid uh, a lot of the PKO. I just try to focus on the stuff that I'm really an expert to. And when I play PKOs, um, I be, I adjust the ranges based on my experience and what I expect people to do. So it's, it's more of like, like an art thing. It's something that I was trying to say before, like, you know, poker is not completely solved. And in many, many um, situations, it's, it's a mixture of, you know, science and, and art, right? So the good thing about being an expert is that once you develop, you know, a, your skill set up to some level, there are some things that you're like, okay, I can definitely go with this. I can definitely call here and it's definitely not losing me money. Whatever. So there are some situations in which, I don't know, I, um, I have a very like bad hand, uh, not that I remember exactly what it was, but I was on the big blank with maybe like, uh, Queen eight offsuit, I don't know. And two guys with a bounty shove with like five big blinds. They got like had like eight big blinds and I'm like queen eight offsuit. It's a terrible hand, but the bounties were so big. I just look at the spot like okay, she's definitely uh cannot be losing money at all. Like you just I just know it. So I just you know flicking the money, but yeah, um, I haven't put as much work as I wish, um, as I wish in uh, I would like to in, in, in the PKO tournaments, and I probably won't because um I just there's so much to be learned and i just try to yeah in the most for the most part skip a lot of the pko tournaments focus on the regular tournaments because also the ev is higher you know um even though the uh in the pko tournaments the fields are softer because you have many recreational players so there's something to be said about that but uh, a lot of the ev is uh evaporating from the price pool when all the bounties uh that are being you know ko'd a lot, you know across the tournament so uh over the long run for the winning players you know the professional players or the very good ones the ones who are going to be making it to the final table the more frequently right over the long run uh it's highly for us to play regular tournaments because uh these portions of the prize pool are not being evaporated they just stay out in the final table so if we're going to be making final tables more consistently and frequently than our opponents then we might as well just play the regular tournaments because we're going to be making more money. A very interesting point of view. Uh, Peter asked, uh, facing min click three bets and four bets, uh, do you make any adjustments like versus the GTO strategy? Min three bets and four bets, you said? Min click three bets and four bets. Well, something that I've been exper experimenting with is just click it back a lot. Um, because many times... Um, you know, when they do it, uh, it could be just a blocker type of hand. So let's say somebody mean trivets you, whatever, um, with an A7 offsuit hand, whatever. You click it back, there's nothing they can do. They can even call, right? Um, now, if you're in the, if you're on the other hand, 
uh, you think that the player is doing it with a, a more of a linear range, right? Like, um, let's say somebody will do it with a uh, no, medium pocket, pocket pair because they want to take, you know, uh, control of the hand and get to the flop, whatever. They could be doing it with a suited connector, right? A suited ball with type of hand. Then I would just uh, forbid and very large. So they don't have a cheap calling position, right? So let's say, I don't know, you're 40 big blinds, you mean raise two big blinds, the guy is making a 3.5, four big blinds or three big blinds, whatever. Uh, if he has something like Queen Jack suited, right? Uh, I want to make it 12 big blinds for him, you know? So, or even bigger, like 15 big blinds with any blocker type of hand and, you know, top of my range so that um, I won't give him a good price to call and they'll just have to stop doing that shit against me because, uh, uh, I won't, you know, let them, I won't allow them to, uh, you know, take control of the hand and just, you know, take this, uh, you know, okay hands and play in position, whatever. Just, I'll just, you know, uh, forbid in their faces and, and put them to the test because I'm very aggressive. I, I don't like folding. Uh, I don't like, you know, uh, <laughs> people letting people running over me. So uh, I tend to be very aggressive against these things. Now, of course, I'll be paying attention if the guy is, um, only shows up or you know with a a very good hand when doing it i'll put a note like if somebody does it and he has aces i'll put a note like okay this guy means to with aces and so next time he does it i know you know that, that you know he, he's at this something that he will be doing with you know um uh, uh top of range but even then you know if somebody does it with aces and then they do it again against me i'll probably still forbid them again because uh um it's not necessarily that you know they all will only be doing it with aces so I don't know. I'm just very aggressive sometimes, I guess. Okay. Uh, in modern poker theory, you wrote that the reason for betting can be basically reduced to uh, leveraging the advantage of knowing your whole cards and realizing or denying equity. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Um, uh, poker players, professional players even, or coaches, oftentimes make the mistake of thinking only about their ranges. It's like, okay, my range is supposed to bet small here, whatever, so we're doing that. And they forget that they're actually playing a poker hand. So um, it is really important to play your hand in the context of the ranges in play, right? So because sometimes, even though a lot of your range wants to go for a small bet, some hands in your range really, really want to go big or whatever, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's really important to always be mindful of the ranges in play and also be aware that the advantage you hold against your opponent is that you know what your cards are. Your opponent only knows your range, right? So um, when you, this is the informational advantage that you have with your opponent and you, you must not never forget that and always, you know, not only play what your range is supposed to be, but also, you know, um, know that your actual holding is really, really important in every situation. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, I was wondering, uh, if there's anyone in the in the in the the group has questions uh we might have a few more minutes uh personally a lot of questions <laughs> i do have a question go ahead what were what are some of the hardest lessons you learned uh throughout your poker career it's a good question um probably harder one is that you you can't beat math right so even if you think you're really really good at whatever you have to be very uh, cautious with the bankroll management. Uh, I went broke three times trying to be a professional poker player because uh, I was an absolute retard with a huge ego, <laughs> and 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 I tried to you know um, to beat the game with no bankroll, no nothing, many times because I overestimated how good I, I could be, and you know I or underestimated balance as well. So. That's why the, the hardest lesson, right? That you just can't beat math. And also studying poker is something that I, I, I read from M. Ben C. B. It's a huge, it's a massive quote. I, I love this one. He said something like, um, studying poker doesn't guarantee winning, but if you don't study, you're guaranteed to lose, right? <laughs> so that's a very good one as well. Yeah, right? uh, yeah I like that. That's good. Thank you. Right. Welcome. Any other questions, guys? 
So we kind of like, we bounced this back and forth. We were looking at some of the um, pre-flop squeeze ranges. And a common theme that we see in a lot of these squeeze ranges are that if they're, if you're the fourth, fourth person in the pot, <clears throat> So a uh, RFI and two callers, uh, you don't tend to have much of a calling range, at least in the charts that I've seen. We were yeah. kind of curious if that's a function of like just how they were ran or if there is something more theoretically there. No, uh, my charts show the same result and I included dunk bets and stuff like that. And, and, and so, yeah, you could make a point about did you know. allow did you allow over calling for like a fifth player fourth up fourth? to fourth players yeah uh, all of my uh my preflop ranges never allow for more than four players going to the flop okay mm. yeah so so there's something theoretically there then yeah yeah exactly okay. yeah the, exactly. yeah the, the main thing is that um once you are like the fourth player coming in um Realizing equity becomes so difficult when you're out of position against all players. And also, uh, you are going to run into dominated hands way too often, right? So uh, a lot of the calling ranges would be like, you know, king, queen suited, queen, jack suited, stuff like that. And there you're calling with the six, eight suited thinking, okay, I'm going to flop a flush and go with it. Well, yeah, a lot of the times you're just going to go with it against a higher flush or whatever. So you're fucked. Even if right. you flop it, you're fucked a lot of the time. So that, that's a problem. That's why... You know, people tend to overestimate. Oh, yeah, I'll flick in the money here with the six eight suited. Uh, probably not so good uh, at the end of the day, unless you flop a straight. Uh, yeah. So it's it kind of must... like over a uh, a really large sample. There's probably some reverse implied odds and the profitability exactly. and extracting the EV with these types of hands is just not not viable. Yeah. Let's say you have six eight suited, right? So if you flop a flush, most likely people will fall to you because it's so always that you probably have a flush on the flop because you're calling suited hands, whatever. So you play super aggressive, whatever. Uh, or uh, if they have like an over pair, they'll be very cautious about it, right? Sure. So mm -hmm. if you end up sticking all of the money in, you're probably dominated for a higher, by a higher flush a lot of the time. And then more often than not, you will just flop like bottom pair, middle pair and be forced to fold. So it's so freaking hard to actually extract value. And then once you actually make a big hand, you're oftentimes dominated. And most of the time you're just going to get in, you know, to flop a weak, trashy hand that is not really worth it. And that's why the solver will really just, you know, take top of range, squeeze and, and, and try to isolate and go from there. And just all of these hands are not really profitable. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Somebody hey, asked you, chat. One had a question that read that one that McLovin, I guess you didn't have a mic. You want to read it? Or you want me to read it? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say that. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. He said, uh, I have a limited time to study and even more limited time to play. Are there some high level and simple things I can impl implement in my game since I won't be able to learn GTO as much as someone like you? Yes. Um, focus on pre-flop game, man, uh, especially in tournaments. The most important thing is is knowing you know when you can reach up, open shove, and all of those things. Uh, what type of hands you should be calling uh, when somebody reach shoves twenty big lanes on you? These things. Focus on that. Um, focus on some you know uh, final table scenarios to kind of know. Even with HRC, just you know very simple software. You don't need to put a ton of time or you know spend a lot of money in some GTO charts. Uh, just at least knowing you know you know what type of hands can you be shoving with or calling with. And preflop, you, you master preflop game. You have the most important thing in, in poker tournaments because a lot of the you know tournaments are playing preflop, especially when you get shallow, you know, towards the end, when it matters the most. So I'll focus on that. And then for post flop, the most important thing is uh, just kind of understanding what type of hands uh, you really want to stack off with on the flop, and what type of hands um, uh, you should be playing very aggressive. Or you know, for example. Um, yeah, just don't be too passive post-flop, which is a huge mistake that I see a lot of the time. So you can put some time into, you know, figuring out what type of hand you should be playing very aggressively. Like for example, let's say you flop top pair with, I don't know, a king three, whatever, and uh, cut off his continuation betting on you. You should be check raising a top pair every time, pretty much almost always on, on you know, 20 big blinds, even 40 big blinds. You should be, be very aggressive and people don't do it. Just check call, check call, play so passive. Or you flop top pair on a jack high board, just let your opponent get there all the time or get bluff. Just, you know, try to focus your study on... Um, 
what hands you're supposed to stack off on the flop mostly, particularly when you're shallow, right? And what hands are worth going with on the flop and pre-flop. If you master that, you probably have like 90% of the most important things, at least for tournaments. All right. Very, very nice. Uh, well, I think if you... Uh... Coral oh, has a ahead. question, LP, um, but it's really long. So maybe if you could just unmute him and he can ask it. Uh, yeah, he can un unmute himself. One last question, though, because hmm. we're running out. I was, well, I was going to say also, um, there's there was a couple questions in the chat about um, how to get in touch with you for maybe things like private coaching. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, you just hit me up on Instagram. It's probably the easiest way. Um, <clears throat> it's underscore M underscore Ace. Instagram, you just find me there. Uh, PM me is the easiest way to get in contact with me because I'm, uh, you know, checking those messages all the time. And He's also yeah. on our Discord, so can or we... yeah, or yeah, just I can also, you know, um, Luis can also give you my my Discord as well if you want to. Um, yeah, I don't have as much time for one-on-one -on -one coaching, but maybe you can figure out something for uh, maybe February. This this month is gonna be impossible. I just don't have the time. Uh, but yeah, I'll be happy to assist any of you guys. You want uh, any one-on-one -on -one coaching? Just you know, um, I have a very good system in which um, normally my students go for the ten hours package. And typically, what I'll do is I'll start by running on my reports in your database. You know, figuring out just seeing the whole picture, everything, and understanding uh, your game at a at a, a macro level in general from the database. Next step is going over a hand history review of a regular speed tournament that you got deep in. Hopefully, you know, um, uh, you know, mid stakes or what, you know, the, the, um, uh, anything that you got deep, very deep into the tournament so that I can see what's actually happening in real hands. And then from there, I will just build a, a program where I will be uh, focusing on your major leagues fixing those because once you, you fix your major leagues, that's what is going to have the biggest impact in your bottom line. And I will, alongside, well, you know, while I, we are doing that together, I will be teaching you how to do it yourself, how to self-analyze, how to do, do, run the reports by yourself so that, you know, you become um, independent and you can do it on your own uh, so that hopefully by the end of the 10 ses sessions, uh, you won't need me anymore. Or if you want, you know, sometimes some players would like to book an or 10 sessions, whatever. But ideally is that, you know, to make myself as useless as possible so that, you know, my students become, uh, you know, um, self-reliant and just can keep doing it by themselves in the future. All right, Michael. Well, that, thank you very much, Michael. Thank it was a great session. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, and that's going to be it for today. So uh, have a great day, everybody. And awesome. I guess, thank you, guys. It was very yeah. nice having you. So see you next time.